Thank you, uh, Carlo, for the invitation and also for inviting me uh, to be the Henry's uh, licentiate uh, thesis opponents. And so thank you for Emil Byungsen for uh, co-organizing this talk here. Um, uh, before the pandemic, I was actually uh, vis I visited at KTH before pandemic uh, as invited by Professor Ki Wong Song and also Professor Jiang's uh, Zenders. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. I'm very happy to be back, although virtually. Uh, so today I want to uh, talk about uh, edge intelligence and how does it change the paradigm of uh, communication and also uh, computing. So some background first. Um, so 5G, now we are in uh, 6G research and 5G is mostly considered a communication network, but uh, a network is very complicated. However, in 5G, it's a, a communication network because uh, um, different uh, functions of the networks, sensing, control, computing, communication, they are designed separately. But in 6G, people, researchers want to increase the KPI by more than an order of magnitudes. And these ambitious goals cannot be achieved by separation approach. Therefore, researchers propose the integration approach in integrating communication, sensing, computing, control. So, 6G is fundamentally different from 5G. It is more a cross disciplinary uh, platform. At the same time, in computing, we are also witnessing a revolution. So uh, 10 or 15 years ago, mostly we talked about uh, cloud computing. Uh, computing was happening essentially uh, at the data centers. But uh, in the past decades, we've seen computing migrating from data centers towards the network age mainly for three reasons. First, microprocessors have become very, very cheap. So basically every single device has a computer inside. And second of all, these devices generate an enormous amount of data and data has become the most valuable resource in the world, replace fuel. How do we know? Look at the most valuable companies in the world. Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tesla, and so on, Microsoft, and so on, right? So data is very valuable. And the third, the number of uh, edge devices connected to the networks is growing at an exponential rate. And we're looking at uh, something like uh, 50 billion of devices in the next few years being connected to the networks. So every day, every hour, an enormous amount of data is being generated at the network age. Why these data are very useful? Because we can use machine learning algorithm to convert the data into artificial intelligence. And these artificial intelligence can make our services and applications smart and automate the operation of our societies. And this is what, what is happening right now. So because edge devices start to have Unlike uh, past communication networks, mostly we're concerned about human-to-human uh, -human communications, but now 6G is different. It also involves machines and uh, make our communication very rich and diversified. Uh, mostly 6G communications is concerning about uh, more sophisticated human-to-human uh, -human communications and also human-to-machine communications. This is something new. And furthermore, machine to machine communications. So this is a very different uh, landscape compared with uh, 5G. 6G, because of the participation of uh, machines, 6G networks aim to be designed to be even faster than human limits. It aims to achieve air latency of 0 0.1 milliseconds. But our human can only react a one millisecond response time, even Jackie Chan's, right? He's from Hong Kong, by the way. So even Jackie Chan's can react in only one millisecond, but our networks is aimed to become faster than zero point, uh, than the one millisecond limit. Why? Because thereby we can use very fast AI to support mission critical applications. More specifically, one major service 6G is targeting is to make uh, VRAR, virtual reality, augmented reality applications, 
empowered to be empowered by AI, right? If we can achieve this kind of latency, then definitely we can meet the required tactile delay of 15 milliseconds, visual delay of 15 milliseconds. We can use AI to enable uh, many kind of uh, VR AR uh, functions such as uh, biometric recognitions, intention of perceptions, and that brings us truly immersive experiences. So in terms of wireless communication, because of all these trends together, we are upgrading the paradigm from Shannon 1.0 to edge intelligence or so-called Shannon 2.0. So what is Shannon 1.0? We are familiar. Shannon 1.0 mostly is about rate maximizations. Or in layman's words, Shannon 1.0 wants to build a very big a big pipe, transporting as much data as possible. Or its objective is can be described as given a constraint on distortions, we want to transmit as much data as possible. The objective of Shannon 2.0 is different. It's N at fast edge intelligence. Its objective is, given a constraint on learning or decision accuracies, we want to distill and use intelligence as fast as possible. This objective is very different. And therefore, we require revolutionize the design of wireless communications. And that is the topic for today's talk. So edge intelligence, let's be a little bit more concrete. What essentially, how is 6G networks going to support edge intelligence? Basically three scenarios. First scenario is distilled intelligence. Mostly you want to use the mobile distributed mobile data to train a global AI models using techniques such as federated learning. So while preserving some data privacy. The second scenario is to, after training, you want to provide intelligence as a service. You pay me, I let you use my large scale AI models. If you are a robot, upload some features to me, I'm going to tell you the inference result using my AI models, which you cannot operate. So this is a intelligent as a service. Now, the third scenario is download intelligence. Maybe you don't want to expose your, 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 your data features to me, but if you pay me, I can download the AI model to you because you cannot store all the possible models. Based on your need, based on your situation, you send a request to me. I have an AI library running in the network. I can download whatever model you need, be it a VR, AR navigation or auto driving. And these three scenarios, is going to be the major services provided by 6G networks. All these services requires transmission of high dimensional data, high dimensional stochastic gradient, high dimensional AI models. It creates a communication bottleneck. I know KTH is world leading in, in 6G research, in terahertz research. Then, but terahertz has a limited range only for short range communication, even for millimeter wave band or lower frequency band, it is overloaded with different kinds of services. More machine type communication, mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency communication. And now we're going to add another type of services, learning or, or, or inference. Then the networks is going to be like this the guy here being overloaded. Peak data rate is a marketing word, something not reliable on a daily basis. Even for 5G, the average data rate is very low, 50 or 100 megabits per second. So we can see that edge intelligence is facing a communication bottleneck. We cannot just solve it in a brute force approach. We need to find a revolutionary, fundamentally new approach. And this approach, as, as an advocate by many researchers, including many at KTH here, can be called Shannon meets Turing. It refers to the fusion cross disciplinary research between information theory and AI. This is not called incidental. During their lifetimes, Shannon and Turing, actually they are friends and collaborators. 
And uh, we, we, we know Claude Shannon as the father of information theory. Something we may not be familiar is that Shannon is also considered the founding father of AI as he's the participants of the 1956 Dartmouth Conference where AI was started, the concept was initiated. So this is uh, the theme of 6G edge intelligence. So I'm going to ask some questions, which seems are controversial, and I'm going to suggest some possible answers here. Now let's look at 1G. 1G re uh, representative figure is a Martin Cooper. He invented the 1G phone, which is what he's holding in these photos here, which is very big. Why is it very big? It's based on analog technologies. It's based on encoded amplitude modulation or encoded frequency shift keying. So we can imagine what Shannon think about him. Probably Shannon will say something like, hey, Martin, this is a digital age. Your unreliable old toy needs Shannon coding. The question I'm asking is, is really everything must be digital. Is really analog communication is that? Probably not. The answer could be not so sure in the 6G era. Now let's look at traditional wireless communication. The fundamental limitation of multiple access in radio access is radio wave superposition. Now, radio access is basically about traffic jam. All the users try to pass their data streams through a common channels. And at the, at the, at the end, at the output, these data streams need to be decoupled. Because of radio wave superposition, it creates interference. And traditional philosophy thinks that this is no good. So therefore, digital technology try to do a pizza approach, pizza cutting approach, cut the spectrum into, into different slices and allocate to different users. This is called orthogonal access, but it lacks the scalability, right? Because the number of user grows, you don't have so much uh, a spectrum to divide. So, however, if we change our philosophies, we realize that for 6G in edge intelligence, the ultimate goal is not so much about radio access, Many times it's about distributed computing. What the output of the channel or the server wants is not really the individual data streams. What it wants is the aggregation function of the distributed data, for example, average or some other functions. So if you realize these end-to-end -end systems, we possibly can ask the question, can we turn interference into a frame to help and solve the scalability problem of multi-access? The answer is yes. Uh, let me show you one example here. This is called analog over-the-air computing that we are very interested about. Carol also <laughs> has a strong interest in this topic here. That's great. So uh, this system here is federated learning, uh, which is quite simple. Essentially, you have a server and multiple mobile devices each device use their local data to train a local models and share the local model with the server instead of directly uploading the data, which violates the data ownership. Okay, so, but the local models are not very accurate. So what server is going to do is trying to do a model aggregation to get a more accurate global models. The aggregation function is that you see there, they're trying to aggregate uh, to sum up over the local model and divide it by the number of devices. So this is a multi-access problem. It's an uplink transmissions, right? High dimensional models uploading. So what uh, a researcher and including my groups have proposed is that each device transmit the model using like a, what Martin Cooper did, linear encoded analog modulations. Why do you want to do that? Because if you want to, you can do that. The waveform superposition property of the multi-access channel can automatically perform the model aggregations. Then the server will automatically receive the aggregated version of the model. And this is what he wants. The major advantage here is that you do not need to cut the pizza because everybody has the whole pizza and can eat the pizza. 
everybody can access the whole spectrum because this is a simultaneous access simultaneous access scheme now this uh, there's some uh, experimental results here uh, the vertical axis is the communication latency the horizontal axis is the number of devices if you do the traditional orthogonal access uh, namely uh, OFDMA, then the, the latency will increase linearly as the number of devices grows. But if you use over the air computing or called aircom, in this case, broadband aircoms, then the latency is independent of the number of devices. So therefore, as the number of devices uh, 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 reach uh, a few hundreds, the latency reduction could be up more than an order of magnitude. So essentially, uh, this show that analog communications can solve the scalability problem of multi-access faced by digital technologies. So essentially, essentially, there are a lot of our uh, research in uh, aircoms. Essentially, the research is centered at one thing, which is a wave shaping, so that the, 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 the channel can be aligned. Why do you need channel alignment? Because all the signals, the data transmitted at devices are distorted by different uh, channels. You need to overcome the channel distortions so that the signal can be aligned with each other to realize uh, the, the, the desired computation functions. This reminds me of uh, Michael Angelos, the, the famous sculptors. Uh, it's like a wave of sculpting, you know? Uh, except that, except that we are not using a knife, but we're using some shaping tools. For example, OFDM subchannel selection, uh, retransmission, like uh, Henry and uh, uh, your, your collaborator, Carlo, is working on, or MIMO precoding, aggregation beamforming, and power control, and so on, right? Different kind of techniques basically provide you a tool to shape the wave so that you get the desired air computation functions. I remind, remember, Michael Angelo said something like this. He sees the angel in the marbles. He coughed until the angel was set free. Sometimes it reminds me that wireless engineer is also a kind of an artist, just that our tours are different from the sculptors. All right. I want to emphasize one fact that by looking at uh, 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 distributor learning, looking at aircom, conclusions could be very different when you're designing a wireless network. Now, let's look at a network densification. When the network becoming denser and denser, more and more user and more base station, we used to think this is no good because it creates a strong interference. But if you look at federated learning networks, the interference also no good, right? It sort of perturb the stochastic gradient that is uploaded by devices to realize stochastic gradient descent. However, it has a two advantages. First of all, the densification of uh, edge devices contribute more data. More data means faster learning. And the aggregation of aircon actually helps us suppress the interference because of aggregation game, something like noise average. So the net benefit of uh, the, uh, a network densification is positive as you see on the curve uh, uh, on the right-hand side there. As you increase device densities, the learning latencies actually decreases until the interference uh, disappears or the data is more than enough. So the conclusion is new here. If you look at uh, these uh, task-oriented scenarios, When Shannon develops information theory in his mind, devices are done, has no intelligence. Their job is to transmit data reliably from one place to another place. Then feed the data to human being, let the human understand, interpret the data. But in situ, the devices are not done. We are talking about communicating with intelligence, robots, or other kind of edge devices. Now let's try to imagine this uh, unreliable communication scenario. Com Shannon communicating with a robot. 
he would say something like, hey, Rob, do you know Einstein's son, blah, 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 is a blah, 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 at university, blah, blah, blah. So there are a lot of errors here, but the robot can actually correct all the errors. You can imagine that the robot saying, so the channel is noisy, but guess what you meant is that Hans Albert Einstein was a professor of hydraulic engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Why the robot can correct the errors? Not because of Shannon coding, just because he has access to a knowledge base, can use the keywords to look up the information and do the semantic corrections. So this leads to a question. Number two, is reliable communications always needed? The answer is not sure, maybe not. I will tell you why I talk about this, but I talk about this because I'm used to staying in, in, in uh, South Korea. And I travel to the uh, 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 demilitarization zone between South Korea and North Korea. Actually, I can look at North Korea from South Korea and look at the remote village in, in, in North Korea. And part of this border is called military demarcation line, which is one of the most dangerous places in the world. The left hand side are North Korea soldiers, right hand side are South Korea soldiers. They can get near the border as close as possible, but if any of them cross the border, they will trigger shooting, they can trigger a war. How is it this relevant to the question I asked just now? Now look at this. Look at the left hand side diagram. Left hand side diagram is a classifier, and there's a boundary called classification boundary here. And uh, there's a two classes of uh, data samples, class one and class two. So the class one and class two, the data samples can get close to these uh, uh, demarca military demarcation lines as close as possible, just like at the North and South Korea borders. But if they cross the border, cross the decision boundary, they make an inference error. So long they stay at the right side, no problem at all. So there's a concept called uh, classification margin, which is actually measures the nearest of data samples towards the boundary, as you saw there, the classification margin. This classification margin uh, quantifies the capability of noise tolerance of uh, AI models. Now, if you look at the right hand figures here, it puts accuracy versus uh, additive noise variance towards the data samples. So as you can see that if I increase the noise uh, 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 perturbations, the accuracy does not decrease. Only until the noise variance exceeds a certain threshold, bam, the accuracy jumps, jumps off the cliff. So this shows that AI model has certain robustness against the noise perturbations. And that possibly can change the scenario of communications. I want to demonstrate an example. This is a distributed AI empowered distributed sensing systems. The sensors are observing different views of the same object, and then they upload the extracted features to the server using aircom, of course. And then the few uh, the fusion, the uh, at the fusion center, the uh, cascaded or average or maximum uh, core average pooling or max poolings will be fed into the inference model and to get the inference result here. So we, 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 are, we have done an experiments on this and the result is shown on the curve here. The MSC measures the air pooling, in this case it's air pooling errors. Uh, as you can see that when you increase the MSC errors, the accuracy initially is not uh, degrading, only after a certain threshold, it starts to degrade. So that shows that it is okay for air comp or air pooling to have certain errors because it has no coding. So long you can control this amount of error to below, below certain thresholds, then we are able to make sure it is robust. Sometimes, not just that noise can be, uh, 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 can be uh, has no harm. We can even turn noise into something useful to accelerate the learning process. Okay, so uh, distributed learning algorithms mostly are implementing stochastic gradient descent. 
So the gradient descent happens on the surface of a loss function. And this loss function can be partitioned into different types of uh, regions. There are one particular type of region is called uh, saddle point or saddle regions. This is a prob problematic because at a saddle point, the gradient is equal to zero and the stochastic gradient descent can get stuck at this place. What people do, the computer scientists, they inject the artificial noise to, to the gradient so that the gradient can escape from the saddle point and continue the gradient descent. You know, we, we have a lot of noise. We do not need artificial noise. We have channel noise here. So if uh, we, what we propose is that actually we can exploit the channel noise to do the job of artificial noise to help the gradient descent uh, 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 to escape the set of points. But then in other regions, the noise could be harmful, of course. For example, uh, what you see the non-stationary region, global optimal regions. So in this case, you need to really increase the SNI, increase transmission power and reduce the noise, right? So in this kind of us, uh, that requires you to uh, develop some new power control algorithm to recognize what is the current situation, what is the current descent region right now, and control the SNR accordingly. If this, this uh, kind of power control is smart enough, then we can actually turn the channel noise into an accelerator to help the uh, learning process. So therefore, noise could be something beneficial. And that also another new philosophy of designing wireless communications. AI has robustness against noise. In the 6G era of edge intelligence, perhaps we can propose some new kind of uh, uh, connectivities. We all, all know that in 5G, there's a three kinds of uh, connectivities. Enhanced mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency communication, massive machine type communication. All these communications, all these connectivity types are reliable. Reliability has some problem here. You look at this curve, that's a Shannon's uh, uh, result here. When you increase the code length, the error probability of the data will converge to zero. And it really approaches zero only when the code length goes to infinities. But if you have a very long code length, then the latency is a problem because you need to wait to receiving the whole uh, code word and then you do decoding, it takes a long time. You cannot fit the fast edge intelligent applications needs. You cannot achieve 0 0.1 millisecond. You cannot act faster than Jackie Chan. So if you allow certain error probabilities, you can allow the code length to be shrink to be very, very sharp. That supports ultra low latencies. And the, the problem of error probability, you control to be sufficiently low so that the AI can absorb this impact. Therefore, this idea suggests that it's possible that for 6G, we can have search some kind of a connectivity for edge intelligence uh, called low latency and reliable communications. And that is uh, something interesting to think about. And that also provides the answer to the second question I asked just now, is uh, reliable communication necessary or not? Probably not always. I want to uh, shift gear and talk about computing. You look at photos here. That's um, the right-hand side photo is an Aaron Turing use an analog computer to crack Nazi's uh, Enigma code in World War II. This is an analog computer. What do you think uh, Shannon will comment? He will probably say something like, hey, Alan, even my phone can do a better job in cracking Enigma code. It is digital. So then let me to ask the third questions. Look at the analog computer. Is analog computing there? Our natural answer is, of course, it is that. Why we come up with these answers here? Because we know all the advantages of, of uh, digital computers. This is a comparison here. Analog computer is only specialized for one problem, for example, cracking a code. Digital computer is just based on a generic uh, transistors, is flexible uh, due to the Boolean algebra. Analog computer has small error, 
but it can accumulate over time. Digital computer is resilient to noise, always re resilient because it's digital. One is one, zero is zero. No ambiguities here. Analog computer cannot get the same answers twice. Today, you use a magnetic tape to record down this, tape, this image. Tomorrow, you play it, it looks very different. 10 years from now, it becomes blur. You cannot see, recognize uh, our grandma, grandpa anymore in the photos. But digital computer always reproducible the results using digital computers. Most importantly, digital computers, because of the, uh, the, 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 the invention of solid state electronics, it allows uh, uh, VLSI and can be made a very, very small. Analog computer is difficult. Although not, not always dif uh, difficult as uh, I'm going to discuss later. And uh, because of that, digital computer has, uh, has been advancing uh, tremendously over the past decades. Now, this is the state of the art uh, computer chips. This uh, chip was a wafer size chip made by a company called Cerebras to run the foundation model or GPT-3, which has uh, 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 tens of uh, billions of uh, uh, parameters. Uh, so these uh, chips here, has a 1.2 trillion transistors. It supports a 400,000 AI cores. My, my cell phone only have a six or maybe a, a, a eight AI cores. But this one here has 400,000 AI cores in order to run the very large scale AI models. So you can see how amazing, uh, how amazing digital technology has advanced. The latest trend in digital computing is to emulate our brain, to create digital brain, because our brain is the ultimate intelligent machine. There are two ways to emulate our brain here. One is a neuromorphic computing using hardware to emulate the uh, communications between the synapses. Synapse refers to the interface between uh, two neurons. Uh, so try to emulate the plasticities in its uh, communications. Basically, it's a communication using spikes with uh, 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 adjustable density, uh, power, and so on, right? The second uh, approach is probably more familiar to us, is to use software, to use uh, neural network models, convolutional neural, neural model, or other kind of neural network models, and the focus here is trying to do global optimization of the parameters of the models so that you can perform certain intelligent tasks. All these two approaches are based on digital, digital circuits. However, digital circuit is facing the limits. If you look, look at the right-hand side, uh, 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 right-hand side evolution first, this basically uh, specifies the uh, uh, shrinking size, the transistor scalings. Our, our Moore's law is built on the scaling of the capability of uh, shrinking the size of a transistor to be very, very small. Right now, TSMC promised to commercialize two nanometer transistors processors in 2024. The ultimate goals they want to realize in the near future TSMC and Samsung is one nanometer in possibly five to 10 years time. This is already reaching the physical limit of transistors. Look at the silicon unit cell. Its a dimension is only 0.54 nanometer. We don't have much margin to, to keep uh, increasing the, the, the to, to, to scale it up uh, following the Moore's law. And therefore we are reaching the saturation region of the Moore's law. So if we cannot, if we cannot uh, 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 keep, uh, 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 keep the transistor densification, then we can look at the computing architecture because computing architecture also has a lot of space to improve, right? Look at the uh, current computing architecture is facing the von Neumann bottleneck. Von Neumann bottleneck refers to the bottleneck that the processor and memory are separated and the shuttling of data between processor and memories consumes 90% of the total computation energy, 90% of the total latency. 
there's a lot of uh, juice to squeeze by redesigning the computer architecture, which is a topic I'm going to talk about later on. And another, uh, another uh, um, uh, dimensions we, we need to really make advancement is on the, uh, um, other than the density of the transistors, we are also lacking behind our brain in terms of the energy consumptions. So our brain is, uh, is, uh, uh, has a 10 to, to a power of 15 synapses. Uh, our high-end uh, AI chip only has a 10 to the power of 10 transistor. And the uh, per operations, uh, 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 our uh, current state of the art uh, consumes a 10 to the power of minus 12 uh, joules. However, our brain only consumes 10 to the power of minus 15 or femto joule per operations. And uh, emulating a neuron is very expensive. Currently, we require 16,000 transistors just to emulate a single neuron. So this is very expensive. So we need to look for some other new technologies. This gives rise to something called in-memory computing to overcome the von Neumann bottleneck. Essential idea is just to put the computer and the memory in the same unit to overcome the 90% of the energy consumptions. The, sing uh, the single element here is called memristor, which is a memory plus resistor. It's a resistance with memory of the electrical signal uh, uh, histories. Uh, this gives rise to uh, two hot areas, or maybe the same area called in-memory computing or analog AIs. So uh, the, the typical implementation of the memristors basically is a sandwich uh, insulating oxide layers between two dielectric layers. By applying the voltage, you can control the conductive filaments between the two dielectric layers to change the resistance. So this is a uh, emulates the plasticity of the neuron communications. Now the power of the memristors, this kind of devices is to arrange the memristors in a, a crossbar array or a, like a lattice. Now, if you arrange them in, in, in this uh, 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 crossbar and then you store the matrix into these memristors by programming the matrix here, G11, G21, G31, because it's programmable, then you input an uh, input vector uh, as a uh, voltage pulses, V1, V2, V3. Basic circuits law, Ohm's law or Kirchhoff's laws, we make sure that the output is equal to the matrix vector multiplication, means that I1, I2, and I3. What is amazing here is uh, it is one shot communication. It is the latency is equal to the pulse width, is uh, in the scale of a nanoseconds, and the energy consumption is extremely low, reaching our brain levels. Our work here is to propose using the in memory computing to empower ultra fast 6G communication, is to build the baseband modules using this kind of a uh, uh, memory store crossbar arrays because a lot of uh, uh, communication uh, communication uh, operations uh, are based on matrix vector multiplications. So uh, we did fabricate a kind of a memory store called resistive uh, random access memories. This is uh, uh, the picture that is real, is the chip we fabricated. The photo there shows the material stack is a secret uh, recipes uh, we derive from experiment and trial and errors. There's a no, no theory behind that. And uh, the right-hand side, a measure, me, uh, measurement results. I want to bring to your attention the right bottom figures. That is based on increasing the conductance of the memory cell and decreasing the conductance of the memory cell by applying positive powers and negative powers. What I want to show you that is a little bit noisy. This is the problem with analog computings. It does not give you precise values when you program a memory stores. So, but it is fast, so you can do reprogramming. You can program 100 values and pick the best one to achieve the accuracy you want and still are reasonable. So uh, basically we use uh, memory store arrays to implement OFDM, to implement MIMO in a uh, uh, MIMO OFDM transceivers, which is uh, for very popular for 5G and 6G. So basically what we did is to, uh, we develop a, a discrete Fourier transform module for OFDM. Uh, basically uh, the uh, memory store crossbar array is real and is uh, only uh, positive. So we need to use a multiple parts 
of a memory star array to map the real part, the, 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 the negative part, an imaginary part, and so on, right? Finally, we were able to implement DFT in one step. Complexity is all the one. This is much faster than the traditional fast Fourier transform algorithms implemented using digital processes. Then the memory star cross bar array recently, researcher has found that it can also implement matrix inversion, not just multiplication. This is a circuit. Uh, 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 this circuit has a two memory star, a memory star, a, a cross bar arrays AA, storing a matrix A. Uh, by connecting using some op amps between them, you can actually implement the pseudo inverse. Our contribution here is really use it to build a complex MIMO detector modules. This is a complex matrix inversion. What is uh, a new features here? Actually, you have a, a transistors. Uh, you see the G1 there, G1 and G2 there. This one can do more switching. You can switch from zero forcing to MMSC by turning on and off the one over SNR term inside the pseudo inverse the, uh, uh, modules, All right? So this is uh, uh, amazing, right? You can do uh, very flexible computations. The, uh, the, why do we want to do this? We also did some comparison with the state of the art uh, processor, communication processor, including Qualcomm Snapdragons, uh, uh, recent research on domain adaptive processor, combine uh, FFT and MIMO uh, in the latest uh, digital processor. And uh, in general, in terms of latency, we can reduce the latency by 10 times and also reduce the energy dramatically because it's a low power consumption. Uh, so the, what we propose, RM and power baseband, why, why it is so useful for 6G? Mainly for three reasons. Memory store in memory computing can achieve, as reported in, uh, um, by researchers from IBM, can achieve femtol zero, which is a, our brain level, kind of an energy consumption per operation, and can achieve nanosecond analog computings. And it is a stackable, you can actually fabricate eight layers of a, in, a, a, a memory store crossbar arrays uh, in the fabrication process. It is very small. It's two nanometer uh, by two nanometer memory store device. So we, by this research, which is the beginning of the research track that we are pursuing, we believe that by combining all my discussions earlier, we believe that analog communication and computing are not dead. In 5G, our air latency, our different connectivity time is only can achieve, uh, achieve a, a, a one millisecond, one millisecond above air latencies. For below one milliseconds, what computing technology, what communication technology can achieve this is a not yet fully known yet and it's an active research topic. What we suggest by this talk here is that with uh, some accommodation of some unreliabilities, we can achieve unreliable but very fast analog communication and computing technology. And we believe this can play an important role in the 6G eras. So with that, uh, I should uh, uh, conclude uh, my talk. So Martin Kruver is back and he will be welcomed by artificial intelligence in the 6G eras. And hopefully today I, I, I deliver some uh, useful messages to you. But the key message is Martin Kruger is back. Thank you very much.